Hello, this is John Majori with Majori on Bowie.com, and I have a very, very special guest with me today, Earl Slick. Earl Slick, one of the most accomplished and consequential guitarists in the history of rock music. He's recorded and toured with John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Ian Hunter, many, many others with multiple solo albums to his credit. He's perhaps best known for his work with David Bowie, going all the way back to the Diamond Dogs era in 1974, and with such albums to his credit as Station to Station, Young Americans, Heathen, uh, The Next Day, and Reality. Um, Earl, I've been listening to you play guitar almost every day for about 35 years or longer, and I want to thank you for the music and thank you uh, for everything that you've been doing. Uh, it's really brought joy to a lot of people. Earl has recently released a memoir called Guitar. I've read it. You see the, the cover behind me. It's terrific. It's a great rock and roll memoir. And also in promotion uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the book, he re-released a remix of his 2003 song, Isn't It Evening, featuring Bowie on vocals. So Earl, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, man. Thanks. That's a great introduction, by the way. I couldn't have said it for myself. <laughs> So let me let me first start with asking you a question about "Isn't It Evening." It's it's one of the few songs where Bowie was the lead singer between uh, between reality and the next day. Are you finding that people's reaction to the remix is the first time they've heard it? Like it's the great lost Bowie song. I'm getting some feedback. The feedback I'm getting, a lot of it is, is this should have been on David's last record. So that's yeah. the biggest compliment I can get. That track was recorded, uh, Christ, in 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 two thousand ish, two thousand one. Okay. And, uh, it was on a record that I did called Zigzag, which also featured Robert Smith and Joe Elliott. All my buddies came in, and yeah, and um, it was never released as a single. The album was released during the reality tour, which we the my then not too smart record company thought it would be a good idea to release it during the tour and it got completely overshadowed and right. we never released the david's track as a single which in hindsight you know what do they say uh the good things are w worth waiting for and and i never had that yes it's time to release it until the book yeah I you know what? This is a good time to get this out there. And we had Bob, Mark Plotty produced it. Mark's done a whole lot of work with David. And then uh, uh, Bob Clearmountain did a, a a mix, the mix that you hear on the radio now. And he did a great job. And, uh, and, and because the song was released so long ago, uh, I, I, I looked at the YouTube. It didn't get a lot of views because it was invisible. So right. in essence, it's kind of a new track. Yeah, that you know, I I bought the album at the time, but at the time we thought that Bowie would be making a lot of albums. In fact, you have an anecdote in the book about around that time before he got sick, he had a plan for touring and making albums. What what was that plan that didn't didn't ever come to fruition? Oh my God, this was a big disappointment, and you know, uh, not making light of David's health at all because shit just happens. But we had a conversation about two months or so before the reality tour was over. And David was, I mean, in great shape. He looked great. Everything was fine. I guess who knew there was something lurking in his body that was going to attack him. But uh, we had a discussion. He said, look, I, I really don't want to do these year-long tours anymore. You know, I got my new daughter and all that. He said, so for the next five years, we're going to do one month of rehearsal and three months worth of gigs but we're going to do residency. So we'll do like a week at Radio City, you know, uh, that like that, a week, yeah. a week, which would be great. He said, there'd be less traveling, more fun. And that's all you got to worry about is four months a year for the next five years. And there'll yeah. be a few albums sandwiched in between there. And then he had that heart attack in Prague. Uh, and uh, that was it. That was it. You know, matter of fact, the last time I brought it up, we were doing the next day, which was the summer of 2012. So this is who uh eight years after the heart attack incident or so, you know. Right. And uh 
we 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 did this track called "You Can Set the World on Fire," and it's it's yeah. a real rocker, right? And he got this big smile. He goes, "Slicky, this thing is great. It would be so good live." And I looked at him. He goes, "Don't even think about it." <laughs> so that was that. Yeah. So the next day, the second to last album, there there had been a gap because of his health issues for for several years, as you mentioned. Um, but in the in the and you're describing the the process of making that and the other albums, it seemed like the process really, really evolved over time. Um, starting with uh, Station to Station, it seemed like the process for making that album, which he claimed to have forgotten or not to have remembered making it. I think he was full of shit because I know David for, well, from 1974 to the day he died. Yeah. And I think because... I think because of this, his, he hated L.A. There was there was a drug problem. Going. I don't think he, you know, I think he remembers more than he admitted to. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he wanted to even talk about it. And I don't blame him. I wouldn't either. But at the end of the day, that to me, and it's not just because I'm on that record. That was a groundbreaking record because right. at the time it was considered like out there, like it was considered now it's normal compared to records that that he had done and other people after that but then it was it, it, it was groundbreaking and um it, 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 it was just a period of time for him that i don't think he he he, he really liked himself very much and, yeah. and you know, i've gone through that myself i don't remember 90 percent of recording young americans it, <laughs> it, the only record I've ever done in my life. I remember every minute of station. I remember about five minutes of of of, of young Americans. So, so on station to station, you weren't just playing the guitar. You you really co-created it. And in the way you discuss it in the book, you take this this. I'm not questioning your sincerity, but you're very very modest about it. But you're really. I mean, the music that we hear is really influenced by you working with David in the studio. Could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, we we went. You know, it's, first of all, it, it, to, to the best of my memory, I think it's correct. Is that we never rehearsed for records. Uh -huh. We just go in the studio blind. You know, yeah. I love doing. That was the best way for me to work. I love going in blind because I'm I'm the guy that if you give me a track to listen to before you record it too many times, I start getting married to the little parts. It's hard for me to be spontaneous. Yeah, so we did rehearse. Uh, but really all it was, was pieces of songs for the most part. Right. And when, when we got in the studio, um, he glued them together. I mean, the, the title track was three completely different pieces. I don't know how the hell he got us to put those together to make sense out of it, but he did. I remember the story you tell in the book. You were sort of walking us through the different songs until you get to the title track. And you're like, the way we made Station to Station the song is totally different. <laughs> it was insane. I mean, yeah. I don't I I mean, I don't remember specifically the order of how we did it, but for some reason there were these three parts and they just worked like a charm, you know. Um, and then there was a song called Stay that he recorded a song with Mick with Ronson years earlier called John I'm Only Dancing. Right. And he used to play that live on an occasion. This is before Station was done. And he wanted to do a new version of it, right? And he said, so he could come up with a riff. So yeah. I came up with that riff. And then what ended up happening was the riff triggered him into writing a whole nother song. But if you listen to that, you'll hear some of the chord changes from uh, John and Molly dancing. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't notice that until I, I'm sort of embarrassed to admit this, but I didn't notice that until I read it in your book. And then I, Stay is one of my favorite songs. I, I, I put it on again, I'm like, there it is. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, uh, I think most, it probably got past most people because, you know, the lyrics is a different song. Yeah. So the, the impression I got from, from reading that is at, um, at that point, you're in the studio with him for days on ends. You're not sleeping. You're 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 pumping out music that, like you just said, you didn't walk into the studio necessarily prepared to 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 develop what you came out with. No. But then w later, by the time you get to something like Heathen and the next day, and um, 
uh, reality, it seems like a far more orderly process. Is, is Am I getting that right? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Kind of. Kind yeah. of. Okay. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, reality was done uh, in bits and pieces where, where mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, uh, I don't think we recorded any of those as a full band. He was bringing in like rhythm section and then this and that. And I preferred always to do it with the whole band, at least for the basic tracks together. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and Heathen was done the same way. Uh, the next day, it was done both ways. There were certain times where we did have a full band and sometimes we're, we're, it was done the other way. But that one, he was working on that for two years almost before it was done because he was doing it. It wasn't consistent. He would work on it for a month and then stop. And Yeah. But so um, he seemed like um, he was in a happier place at, the, at that point. Um, was it did it make a difference working with him? You, you mentioned in Station to Station, he wasn't necessarily happy with where he was and just in life. What what version or what what time period was it uh, was it best to work with Bowie and, and actually making the music? You know what's funny in station to station it was it was great it was just yeah. it, when the work part came that never changed it yeah. as our relationship went but you know around the diamond dogs period on through station to station and look I'm as guilty as he was with the drugs so you know our relationship wasn't strained we really we we had a relationship in the studio but we really didn't have much of one outside the studio which I kind of preferred yeah you know, I liked that that separation bit. And um, as time went on, especially when we got into the new millennial here, into the 2000s, he was the happiest I've ever seen him, ever. Yeah. Ever. And, and it was great. And, and we actually, at that point, we, we became more friends and talked more, you know. I mean, you can't, if you got two guys on cocaine, you're not going to have a conversation. <laughs> It's, you will, but it, it, it is what it is. D different type, uh, d different than having a conversation over uh, espresso and biscotti. That's exactly what we used to do. Yeah, that's. <laughs> in, in the... <laughs> so, um, so he, you, you played with him for about forty years, but not on every album. And it, the sense I got from reading the book is that he would sort of flit in and out of your life. And how is it that you didn't get frustrated with that? I did get frustrated once. That's it. Yeah. Once. And that was when we finished the Diamond Dogs tour and there was going to be a break in the summer and we were going to convene in like in September or something. And I never got a phone call from him. Yeah. And I did get a phone call from some guy that worked for him who I was never very fond of saying, oh, by the way, we got a new guitar player. You're out. That's his exact words. Yeah. I was pissed off. So three weeks later, I get another phone call. David wants you to come to L.A. to rehearse. And I think what happened was is that because Carlos was in the band and David was going more towards a, his, his version of R&B, yeah. that, that was great. But what he forgot was that what happens when we got to do when we have to do uh suffragette and all the rock tunes you know so yeah. uh, after that though there were t I was never fired um yeah. sometimes uh, just didn't get called yeah. you know and, and I just took it for it, it was just who David was it was never malicious yeah. you know uh it's just the way things worked out and I and I just rolled with the punches on it, you know. Even even uh for the heathen tour, um I you know, I got a message from somebody that said, look, before you hear this on the street, David's got this other guitar player. And I said, All right, whatever. I was in the middle of doing something anyway. And then um I texted him. I said, I'm I'm gonna be in the city next week. Uh, why don't we uh, go get a coffee or something, you know? Yeah, great. So I get a call from an assistant saying, David's not very well right now. So uh, why don't me and you meet up? So I met up with her 
And she goes, oh, before we do that, let's stop by the studio. I get to the studio, and David was sick. And he was, it yeah. was uh, during heathen. He was doing a vocal. And he's in the vocal booth, and 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 he comes out, and he says, uh, by the way, what are you doing in April? I said, I don't know what's going on in April. He goes, we're going on tour. Get your shit together. But you, you know what? <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's it's a weird business, and 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 with him, it was, uh, you know, I could liken it to a kid that's playing with this toy, and he gets all excited about this new one, then he forgets to play with the other one. Yeah, that might not be a great analogy, or it might even sound insulting, but it was wherever his head was at at the time, he just did it. Well, I got that sense that didn't include me. I got that sense that um, that you didn't necessarily know you're on so many albums, but you don't necessarily know the next one you're going to be on. No. And yeah, that's I, I really didn't imagine that um, that a, a guitarist of your stature wouldn't have it all worked out in advance. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Yeah, I guess David, it didn't work out like that with David yeah. because also. If you listen to David's records over time, how many of those records, if you really take all the records and you compare one to the other, how much of them are really that similar from the other one? They change a lot. Right. And a lot of it had to do with with uh, the guitarists, like, you know, bringing Adrian Blue in and Fripp and these guys yeah. that do other stuff. So I had two choices. I could hold a grudge and be an asshole or I could say, you know what? The guy has done more for me than anybody else on the planet for my career. And I love working with him. It is what it is. Yeah. Let me ask you two quick questions about uh, two other albums. Um, one is the uh, Diamond Dogs, which you're not credited on. But, uh, you know, I, I learned from reading your book that you you do uh, play on it. You did overdubs. What's on I'm it? I'm not sure about that. Maybe yeah. I wasn't clear enough in the book on that. Um, my audition... When I got called to do the audition, I thought I was going to be in a room in a rehearsal with a band and David, and it wasn't like that. I I, they, I went to RCA Studios in New York City, recording studio, <laughs> and uh, his assistant walked. I didn't even see David right away. I, 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 I was walked into the main recording room, and they had, they had asked me in advance what amp I wanted. So the amp was there. There was a set of headphones. And a voice comes over the intercom, says, uh, put on the phones. It was an American voice. So I'm imagining it was Visconti. And uh, I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do? He says, you know, uh, we're going to put some songs up. Just play along. I said, what key are they? And they said, don't worry about it. So I just played along for, uh, maybe for a half hour. Yeah. And they, they may or may not have recorded some of that because, I mean, I reduced distinctly remember one of the tracks was diamond dogs the, 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 yeah right so they could have easily recorded it without me knowing it i don't know it's yeah possible. wow that's wow that's interesting so the other album i wanted to ask quickly about was young americans um which you which you definitely played on um the song fame is credited to bowie carlos alamore and john lennon and you played with john lennon on double fantasy and milk and honey how much did he actually contribute to fame? John? Yeah. I don't know because I wasn't with them when they wrote it. Yeah. That, that big fat lick, not the Carlos yeah. funky lick, but the other one, that's me and John playing that lick. Uh-huh. I don't, I, I'm, based on, on the lyric, I think John had more to do with lyric, and David had more to do with the with the yeah. track. But I'm sure that the lyric was a, was a co-write. Yeah, yeah. I, I I read different accounts, and I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know what to believe. So, um, so the book overall, one of the things that strikes me is you have this tremendous sense of um, modesty. Whenever you mention another guitarist, whether it's Mick Ronson or or Keith Richards, um, you, you you write of them with such respect that I, I almost feel like at some point, don't you realize that these people feel in awe of playing with you? I mean, you're on some of the the most consequential records in rock music. I I don't see it. <laughs> uh, 
once in a while, somebody will say something to me yeah. and they appreciate it. You know, I, I'll give you an example. I was at, uh, there's a trade show they do every year. I stopped going there. It's called NAM. Uh, it's uh, National Association for Music Merchants. And they do it at the uh, uh, convention center in Anaheim. And basically it's boots set up with guys with their gear. It's a trade show. And I was sitting at a, a, a an amp booth. Some guy wanted me to try his amps out. So he handed me a Telecaster and I'm playing through it. And, and I hated the amp, but the guitar was amazing. I said, Jesus Christ, this guitar is incredible. And I hear his voice behind me. I go, he goes, I, I, I made that guitar. And I turn around and I meet a guy named Bill Nash, right? Yeah. Nash guitars. And um, he said, you really, I said, I love this thing. He said, you know what? What if I make you one? I said, well, I'm already endorsed by another company. He said, it's got nothing to do with that. He said, I listen to Men Without Shame and some of the other work you did. It meant so much to me that this is my gift to you. Yeah. And he built me a guitar. Yeah, you, you have to realize that that's the effect that the music that you make has on people. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, I, I, sometimes it's David Bowie or John Lennon gets the credit. They're the, you know, the headliner. But so many songs that you were on wouldn't be the same if, if it wasn't you. But I'm not asking you a question. I'm just telling you my opinion. <laughs> Well, you know what? I'll agree with that. There are yeah. some things that definitely my mark is on there. Stay is one of those tunes. Even Station, the title track. A lot of Station is Station. My stamp's all over that thing because we did the basic track with myself, Carlos Alomar, uh, George Murray, and Dennis Davis, you know, and then when the basics were done, most of it was just me and David in the studio doing all the guitar overdubs. Yeah. Would you say that's the same with um, Golden Years from Station to Station? Golden Years, um, I came up with the opening look. Yeah. Um, and it was that that song. Actually, that song was probably the one that was closest to being a finished song when we went in. But yeah. he, needed, he needed a lick for the opening of it. Yeah. And I, I, I it just popped into my head. And the funny thing is, is that lick is a combination of two licks that I ripped off. One of them is part of an old song called Funky Broadway. Uh-huh. It was a, a hit here. And, and and also part of a song called Outside Woman Blues by Cream. If you listen uh -huh. to both of those songs and you merge them, that's golden years. Yeah. Well, any truth to the, the story that uh, Bowie initially wanted to give it to Elvis Presley? I never heard that. You never did? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take yeah, that. You know, look, a... The rumor is still abound about all kinds of stuff, you know. Yeah. I'll take that as a false rumor then. Yeah. So um, I had, uh, as you know, I did an interview like this with uh, Rob Fleming from Killer Star, which you're on, um, the Killer Star album. Um, Rob Fleming um, had gotten together a group of uh, Bowie alums. And I've also seen you... Um, on uh, the the cel the Bowie celebration um, uh, concerts with uh, Mike Garson, mm -hmm. and I, what is it about? I mean, it's a lot of the alums that had played with Bowie, I, I I'm under the impression did not necessarily play together with Bowie. What is it about this um, uh, almost alumni association that uh, that gets you guys to uh, uh, come back together and make new music? The ones that we did with Mike, right? Because Mike organized, Garson organized those. And we did one yeah. in 2018, one in 2019. There was there was a number of reasons for that. Uh, there was a healing process for the band. Yeah. And it was for the fans, too, so that they could, you know, because, I mean, those tours were only done only a few years after he passed away. So it was still fresh. So we did right. those two tours. Uh as far as me doing other projects with the alumni, I, I don't do them. I don't, don't. I, I really don't like to do them, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I liked Fleming stuff because it was really well written. And the only reason I didn't show up at the gig is I was at the tail end of my Lyme disease at the time. Oh. And, and I didn't trust that I could do the show right. So yeah. I, had to, I had to bail out on it, but I would have done the show. Um, it's a very few people 
that I would record with or sit in with that are going to go in that direction. And and lately, I I just I'm done with it, you know. And it's it's no disrespect to David or the fans, but you know, uh, a lot of times a lot of artists they just want a piece of it you know and it's like i don't know i'm not comfortable with it most of the time yeah what are you working on now what's next uh right now well we just released a single so basically the last three months or four months has been book promo yeah uh, organizing getting the single out and now i've got this wacky idea about going back in the studio somewhere in the next month to do another record and i really don't want to say what it is because i don't know what exactly it's going to turn out to be but uh, i want to do something that's going to push me out of my comfort zone and i've been listening to a few new artists uh, uh kalo was one of them is that his name uh he does this great blues thing but it's it's not traditional you know um, I want to try to approach blues. Look, I've spent a lot of time playing with Buddy Guy, you know, yeah. and I don't propose. I, I'm my roots of blues. Yeah. I would I, I'm trying to put my head, wrap my head around doing a hybrid of of almost almost electronic tracks, but not not like cheesy ones, but using yeah. different kinds of sounds and then using my my blues over I don't know yet. And I won't know what it's gonna be until I get in the studio. Yeah. Well I I whatever it is, I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I so, can't wait to the first day to see what the hell happens because you know it could blow up on my face, but who knows? I might hit on something. Yeah. Well, Earl, I, I feel like I could talk to you all day. I'm respectful of your time. I'm just going to ask you a couple closing questions. Of um, course. So um, this, the first is sort of silly. Um, I mentioned the the biscotti and espresso. So what's the best biscotti in New York City? Uh, Bella Ferrara. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Bella Ferrara. I mean, it's not Ferrara is the big famous one. It's called Bella Ferrara. And... and a matter of fact, when we did the next day, every day on the way to the studio, I'd stop and buy a box of it, and we'd sit in the control room while we were going over the songs, you know, on yeah. acoustic guitars. And we, did, we did a whole box before the session. <laughs> I'm I'm in New York quite a bit, so that's why I asked. Come on, so Tank, here, buddy, you got it. This has got to be. If we're going to be on video, we got to have this. Come on, bud. Come on up. Up we go. Oh, here he is. <laughs> is that in Newfoundland? He sure is. Yeah, he's enormous. <laughs> ah, he's my big baby. Yeah, that's great. So let me let me just close with this. I ask everybody this question. Uh, what's your favorite Bowie song and album, whether you played on it or not? Ooh. That changes sometimes. Yeah. Lately, for some reason, I've been on... Uh, and I've even, I even sit down and play along with it. It's uh, uh, Starman. I don't know what that, I, I don't know why. About three weeks ago, maybe I heard it somewhere uh, without realizing it. Yeah. And pulling up all the different live versions. And, and the one we did at Glastonbury kicked the ass. I loved yeah. it. You know, and the, the original that Mick Ronson, first of all, I, I mean, Mick to me is the is the Bowie guitar player. He really is. I mean, and the string arrangements that, that Mick did on Starman are stellar. He, yeah. he did a lot of work with David that he never got credited for. You know, uh, and I always loved Mick playing. I mean, we met and we became very good friends after I had the falling out with David over the, uh, the station tour when I left right. the band. So me and Mick would commiserate. We'd get drunk and commiserate, and, and and we had fun. I loved Mick. Mick actually produced the first batch of demos that I did for the Earl Slick Band, and the record company turned it down because they said they didn't think Mick Ronson had production ch ch chops. And I was like, I couldn't fight with them about it because they had the money. <laughs> I'd, I'd never heard that story. So did you ever release anything that uh, that you did with him? Yeah, wow. What a loss, though, that he's gone. 
I know. That was, uh, you know, too young, man. He was only 40-something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I, you know what's funny is is is, is uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was with Reeves Gravel, another Bowie guitar player. Yeah. And, uh, I was in London, and we were going to go with lunch. He said, by the way, I forgot I got a session today. I said, okay, we'll do it another day. He says, no, just come with me. All right. So I went. And I'm in the control room with the producer and and Reeves, and there's a girl sitting in there. And I'm looking at her, and I'm going, I, I, I think I know who this is. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. It was Mick's daughter, Lisa. And it was her record. And I ended up playing <laughs> a couple of the songs just because I was there. Well, you have a list in the back of your book of all the albums you played on, or at least I think they're all the albums. And it's like four pages long. <laughs> you know what? We had to, we, when, when they first pulled up the discography, I, I said, we can't do this. Yeah. Okay. I said, a lot of those are one-offs. I don't even remember, you know, uh, some of them were people I didn't want to be associated with. So we eliminated about three quarters of it. And that's yeah. what's left is in the book. Wow. So I bought the book as soon as it was released, I ordered it from England from, um, uh, from Waterstones, uh, yeah. is it is it available in the states? I know you've done a lot of promotion for it in England. Are you, are are you doing a book tour in the U.S.? What's going on right now is that it's the U.K. and it's Canada. Um, yeah, nothing in the states yet. Um, I'm waiting. I'm waiting until I feel the time is right to get uh, a publisher here. Yeah. You know, we kind of tested the waters a long time ago, but I want to, you know, uh, I want the right publisher. Yeah. You know, you know I, I, this is, you, I do this blog. I write about David Bowie every day. And um, I really get the sense that there's more interest in, in Bowie now than there even was, um, you know, while he was alive. Um, not all the time he was alive, but, I I think that there's a there's an appetite for information about about him and his music. Uh, so the the timing of the book I really think is 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 a really good timing. Do you, do you sense that? Do you sense that there's a there's there's a kind of an interest that maybe wasn't necessarily evident, um, say twenty years ago? It's a different interest, you know, and, yeah. and I think that, to be honest with you, I think the interest and 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 the legacy is a lot stronger overseas than it is here. Yeah. Um, Although you can't walk down the street in Manhattan without running into his image. <laughs> right. But in England, you can't walk down the street without me getting stopped. I mean, <laughs> I could walk around the States like I'm totally invisible, which I'm totally good with, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, once you get associated with somebody like that, uh, you know, fans can, you know, certain varieties of fans can be intrusive. And, you know, look, I'm not any big star. I never pro profess to be like that, you know, but uh, the fans in England seem to, they're just different. It's a different thing in the UK than it is here, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah it's a lot different in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know. I, I think, you know, you could be right about that because over over a course of time after Elvis died, it was the sometimes you gotta die to get the extra attention. I that's, you know that's I don't, when you get the lifetime achievement awards and all that. So you gotta be dead first. <laughs> <laughs> well, um it's hopefully. Oh uh oh um <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully that's not a universal uh principle, but <laughs> Earl Slick, this has been tremendous. Uh, I Again, I can't thank you enough for um, your work, for your contribution to culture and music and uh, everything that you've done. I, I, I said, I'll i repeat what I said in the beginning. Hardly a day has gone by in the last 35 years where I haven't heard you play on something. Um, so this is really an honor to have you on, um, and uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, any last words? Hi, man. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And if well, you haven't well done, my friend. And it even got the dog in there. I make sure that he's in every one of these things. He's the love of my life. And now he's whining because he wants to go out. Okay. All right. Well, you can't say no to that. Really? Earl Slay, thank you very much. Cheers, mate.